So next yeah. up, we have David Peltier. David Peltier is a portfolio manager that has worked with Jim Cramer's Charitable Trust. His goal today is to give you a primer on the many different asset classes available for investing and how to determine if adding them to your portfolio is right for you. He'll also, also chat about holding cash in your account and discuss on how much cash you should think about keeping on the sidelines. So without further ado, I pass the reins over to David Peltier. Hello, David. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. It's, it's my pleasure. And I want to thank everyone for having me, especially Lindsay Bell, former colleague of mine. I want to thank her for inviting me to talk about diversification. Not It could have been yesterday. It could have been yesterday when the NASDAQ was up for the eighth straight day. But <laughs> I think it's more important now than ever when you're talking about a day, when you look at the Dow, down 700 points, you're looking at just about everything, almost every asset class down across the board. So we're going to talk about today how you can kind of manage your portfolio to ride some of these waves. So we invest to make money, but we diversify to survive. So I put up these couple of quotes, and one's really old and one's kind of old. And I took a look at the Thomas Edison quote, because it, what it really comes to say is that we need to have a plan. It, it's one thing, we're investing to make money here. And there's plenty of money to be made whether when you're investing, whether it's in stocks, bonds, or, or all the different assets out there. But without a plan, it makes it difficult to survive. Now, I've only been at this for about 25 years or so, but I've seen enough cycles to honestly last me a lifetime. Which brings us to our, our second quote, Mr. Peter Lynch, who's retired, but unlike Mr. Edison is still with us. Um, this is really important, especially if you're newer to investing. Look, you're only going to be right about six times out of 10. You talk about some of the most successful investors in the world, billionaires, and they make billions each year. They're still wrong 40% of the time. So that's something as an investor uh, you have to learn. And you also have to learn that sometimes being wrong means you're going to lose money. But accepting that and knowing that is part of the learning process. And every time we lose money, every time we're a little bit wrong, you, you keep that memory somewhere in your head. And the reason you do that is because markets don't always repeat themselves. So there'll be people out there and say, oh, this chart reminds me of 1980 something and this. It's not always going to be exactly the same, but there are repeatable uh, good things we can do and also repeatable mistakes that we can make if we're not careful. So a very good lesson to learn is you're going to be wrong. Um, but if you're right more than you're wrong, you're going to make money consistently at doing this. So that's why we diversify. And that's why we're here today. So here's going to be the one chart. Here's going to be the one time for the next 40 minutes or so, 35 minutes or so, that I'm going to be a little dry and boring. But before we get into the fun stuff, we kind of have to understand why we're here today. So I teach statistics classes. I could talk about correlation for a whole week. If you want to hit me after this, find me on social media. We'll talk about uh, correlation. But when we look at this chart, we have some important things to, to realize. When we're talking about diversification, you ultimately want to find correlations that are negative. Now, just so you know, everything negative on this chart, as you can see up top in the key, is going to have a parentheses around it. So when you take a look at the very bottom line, you're looking at the S&P 500. So most people consider when they talk about the stock market, it's essentially 500 of the largest, most common, most popular stocks out there. So when you look at the bottom row, um, some of these interesting things, when you look at, say, international stocks or long short equity, um, almost what you would think of with the traditional hedge fund, some of those correlations are very high. For every $1 the S&P 500 moves up, uh, owning an international stock does buy you some diversification but it's still gonna move 85 cents for every dollar in the same direction. That's what the positive number means. Why you want this negative correlation is because you wanna have a built-in hedge. And I don't wanna oversimplify the idea of hedge funds, but the most simple hedge funds when they were first, first invented was buy your favorite stocks in concentrated positions and kind of short the market against it as a hedge. So when we take a look at some of the things that are negatively correlated, with the S&P 500, which is your traditional stock basket, uh, we look at things like currencies, foreign currencies. We look at things like investment grade bonds. Um, obviously cash has little to no correlation. Um, 
if you're invested in a stock that goes up 20%, great. If you weren't invested, it basically didn't make any money. So that's kind of what that zero means, short of any interest you might make. So this is something we're going to, we're not going to, I'm not going to go back to the screen per se, but we're going to refer back to some of these correlations. It really is the basis of everything we're talking about today. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is investing in U.S. stocks. Why? Because most of the investors that I know of, probably most of the investors on this call are U.S. based. Uh, so invest in what you know. Um, but when you actually talk about buying individual stocks, if that's something you're ready to do, and I think a lot of people here are, um, it really is important, I believe, to buy what you know. There's been a lot of speculation in the market that, uh, in, since the March-April lows, um, and a lot of speculation has been in stocks that, frankly, I don't know if people really understand what's going on. But remember, anytime you invest, you're investing with some sort of financial goal in mind, and it's generally a long-term goal. It's okay to have short-term goals. It's, there's nothing wrong with making money in the near term. I'm not allergic to that. But usually we have a longer-term goal in mind. And to, to pull the trigger, to really make an investment, especially with a stock, you really want to understand what the business is. What do they do? Because you're buying a piece of paper. And even if you don't really receive the piece of paper anymore, it's just a digital click, you're still buying a fraction of that company. So the health of that company, the profits they make, the ups and downs that company faces on every day, that, while not reflected in the stock market every day, that's ultimately what's going to drive that investment higher or lower. So we really want to understand what we're buying. And I think you'll see this is a, a theme that uh, kind of sticks through as we talk about the other assets as well. So once you've bought a couple stocks, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10, maybe it's a little bit more, maybe it's a little bit less, you want to make sure they diversify. Now, in this case, I want you to think maybe you're a card player, maybe you're at the poker table. It's the one time where an unsuited straight is going to get you a better hand than having four of a kind. Now, when you talk about diversification, one of the most simple ways to diversify, diversify your stock holdings is across different sectors. Um, you take a look at what's in the S&P 500, if financials are a big component. I don't need to own 100% financial stocks. I want to own some financials. I want to own some, te some technology. I want to own some consumer. I want to own some industrial. That's one of the simplest ways you can diversify. Again, you want that straight. You want the five, six, seven, eight, and you want to be able to fill in that hole with your fifth stock. You don't want the four of a kind here. So it's almost kind of like the, the anti-card playing, the, the, the anti-poker when you're diversifying. Now, it's also key, I think, and this is something that a lot of beginning investors um, miss the mark on, uh, and it can be to either side. They either invest in small stocks, and if, if you go through my bio, I've specialized in small cap and low dollar stocks for, for decades now, but they either only buy those stocks, and you're seeing that with some of the more speculative main, names that we don't have to mention, outright today, or they only buy large cap stocks. They only buy the largest companies in the world. And I'll just go, you know, Apple, Microsoft, whatever. They only buy the large ones. They only buy the small ones. Again, you're not getting the diversification. There are times, and you don't need to look at the historical numbers, which we just showed you a decade of. There are times, just pull up the, the market screen, however you look at it, TV, online. There are times when small cap stocks lag the market horribly. But there are also times historically, there are parts of the year, and there are also times when small cap stocks are going to do better because people are in a more speculative mood right now. Um, or there are times when large cap companies are going to do well because they're considered to be higher quality stocks. So those stocks will rally and maybe small cap stocks will lag. And your portfolio may lag as a result if you're only invested in a certain class of company. So when you look to buy a new stock to fit into your portfolio, make sure it fits. That's definitely something you want to do. It could be a good investment overall, but it may not fit in your portfolio right now. So it's something we need to start thinking about as we're building our investment portfolios. And also, I think this is a key one. Sizing really matters uh, when you're making investments. Make that investment count. Um, generally, you don't want to own so few stocks or, or have such a concentrated investment that uh, any one company is going to make up more than 10% of your portfolio. But you also want it to count. Uh, usually when I do research on a stock, I'm going to spend at least an hour on it, if not more. 
Uh, I'm not just throwing darts uh, against the board uh, on the newspaper or just picking things randomly. Um, I want to make it count. I want to make some money off of it. But remember, we're managing risk here with our diversification. So anything more than 10%, I don't care if you think it's the best stock in the world. You, there are days when it's not going to be the best stock in the world. And we want to survive to see tomorrow. So we don't want to, we don't need to own more than 10% in any one investment, stock or otherwise. So we talked about a little bit before about international stocks. Um, if you choose to go international, um, it's it can be a decent hedge, although we've seen uh, the the historical correlation numbers say maybe not as much as it used to be. And I think that has to do with the globalization of the economy. Um, so maybe it's not quite what it used to be. But remember, we go down to the second bullet. Uh, one of the reasons you buy international stocks is you get that currency risk. And if we go back to our correlation screen, we saw that currency was one of those uh, negative correlations. So with international stocks, you get kind of twice the bang for the buck. You get double the risk, but you also get double the reward. Um, you get that currency aspect, which can work for you or against you. But there's also, there's just more uh, regulatory risk, which is what I mean by government risk. That's especially true as you're moving um, overseas into more emerging markets. Um, but anything with investing and everything we're gonna talk about today, the more risk potential, you wanna make sure you're getting the more reward potential. That's why we take on risk is to get more reward. Um, focus on the leaders. And, and this is true for international stocks, especially if you don't understand the local market that you're investing in. Uh, you'll see whether it's telecom companies or whether it's manufacturing companies or banks. And this is true of uh, some of the larger industrial com countries in Europe uh, in Asia and elsewhere. If you focus on the leaders, especially if you're not as uh, in tune with the local market, oftentimes there'll be a monopoly. That's well, let's call it an oligopoly. <laughs> monopolies are illegal. It, it generally, the leaders are the leaders for a reason. Um, you don't necessarily want to speculate as much overseas if you don't know the local market. And that's another thing we're going to be talking about a lot today. Know what you buy, know what you own. That's the best way you can diversify your risk is really understanding what you're buying. Now, look, you can come to this and say, international stocks, it's not for me. Um, you said before, or the numbers say before, the correlation is pretty high. I don't need to, I don't feel like I need that international exposure. And so I'm going to tell you that in some ways that that's okay. You can totally skip this part. I'm going to talk about a sample asset mix later. Um, and this part can be totally swapped out. All investment choices you make are ultimately up to the individual. Um, figure out what you want to own uh, and, and make the investments you want to make. We're just trying to educate you on how in each investment works. And one of the reasons why you can get away with skipping this uh, as a US investor especially, is that when you look at the S&P 500, uh, approximately a little bit more than 40% of the profits are generated overseas anyways. Do you look at those top companies in the S&P 500, just throw out Apple, it's basically the largest company in the world, um, a lot of the money, and in fact, a lot of their cash is actually generated overseas. So you kind of already get that hedge built in. So I want to talk for a second, not necessarily about individual investments, but just kind of investment themes. And this kind of gets into the idea of, of, of having a plan going into it. So again, my background is primarily, was initially uh, in stocks. And so some of the key investment themes that I found have worked over time um, that, that could, cer could certainly be worth a look in the future are a few of the following. Um, finding companies that are about to turn profitable. Uh, and the reason for that is Wall Street is reactionary. There's a lot of smart money uh, investing in a lot of things. And there's a lot of people always looking for investments in different ways. But the simple fact of the matter is the biggest daily moves in stocks are made because Wall Street's reactionary. People that trade some of the largest accounts in the world, they trade based on the news, they trade based on the order flow. Um, if a company reports earnings once every uh, three months, there could be several days in between of the, of the 60 or so trading days in between, but there's not really much going on, but the stock's still gonna move, but it's probably not gonna move much. It's only gonna move based on the overall market. But when there's news, that's when you're gonna get your big moves up and down. 
That's why I look for companies that are about to turn profitable. For whatever reason, I don't find a lot of company, I don't find a lot of investors doing the research in this area. However, uh, both the research shows, uh, there's empirical research, um, something is one of the statistics class we're, we're very keyed in on, but also uh, something just has seen in my own experience that buying before you get profitable can be a good time to buy a company. So it's something I look for. Now, again, none of these are foolproof ideas. In fact, funny story, I once had a screen on my Bloomberg terminal, the greatest screen on earth. I love running stock screens based on uh, different characteristics I look for. And you know what? The greatest screen on earth that had stocks that had everything I ever wanted to invest into a company never generated one good investment. So these are ideas to look at, but there's never going to be that magic stock out there. Um, don't forget dividends. Um, you don't want to forget dividends, again, because looking over the past 100 years or so, the good folks at Standard & Poor's have told us that more than 40% of the, the historical returns of, of investing in the S&P 500 has been through dividend investment. Now, dividends are also really key, I think, right now, because interest rates are very low. Not only have they been low for the last 12 years, but if you listen to what we're hearing from the Federal Reserve, they're probably going to be low for at least the next two or three years. So if rates are at 0%, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, whatever, and you can find a good solid dividend that pays you 3%, you're ahead, of, you're ahead of the game right now. Even if the stock is flat, the stock does nothing. You're basically making more in that stock by taking on the extra risk of the stock than you would be by just not investing the cash and earning a very small uh, interest payment on it. Uh, again, I think it's the single best sign of confidence from management. Um, you've seen a lot of companies cut their guidance because who knows what's going on with the coronavirus. And, and it's the biggest, best companies in the world have had to cut their guidance. But you look for the ones that are raising their dividend right now between March and today. Those are the companies that I think uh, are giving you a real sign of confidence, especially when they have the cash flow to back it up. And along the same lines, uh, following the management team, look at who's buying their own stock. Uh, it's, there are several reasons why uh, people might sell stock in their own company. It doesn't mean they don't like it. You know, maybe they're diversifying their own portfolios uh, and 90 something percent of their wealth is in the company. We don't know. There's, there's no box when you read the form for, oh, I want to add a room addition to my house and build a pool and put my kid. There, there's no box for that. So we don't know why they're selling. But generally, when you're buying, uh, it's their own money. And they're buying because they know the company better than anybody else. And they, uh, they think their money is best invested in their own company. Now, again, this is not something we blindly follow. Anybody should blindly follow. But it's one of the things that I look for, one of the things over 20 plus years that I found has led to good ideas to research further and consider investing in. So we've talked about stocks a little bit. Now let's go over to bonds. And for most people, that's probably going to be through some sort of bond fund, because other than the um, other than the shoebox of Series Double E savings bonds that uh, my grandparents used to give me for my birthday, it, most people probably don't buy individual bonds. So the, the easiest way to access bond investments is through bond funds. Now, bonds are a very simple investment, uh, both in a textbook or otherwise. It, just make sure you're getting what you pay for. So when you think about treasury, it's generally considered the risk-free rate. Um, the, the federal governments almost always had a AAA bond rating. And in the worst stress test ever, it would be one of the last things probably uh, to, to, go, to go bankrupt. So you kind of base everything off of what the treasury notes and the treasury uh, yields are paying right now. So everything that's a little bit more risky than that, you should get a little bit more yield than that. So when you're thinking about a bond fund, am I buying high yield? High yield generally means higher risk. Make sure you're getting compensated for that. If you're not, then again, bonds are a pretty simple investment. If you just want to buy bonds, maybe consider a fund. It spreads it out more for you. It kind of does the work for you. And again, I think it's okay and safe to enlist help. Again, by the way, those savings bonds upstairs are getting 0.1%. If you're a little rusty on your percentages, that means it's $1 a year in return for every $1,000 invested. So I keep them for sentimental value, but honestly, there are better investments out there right now.
Um, and don't forget about the taxes. I think that's really important to think about when you think about bond funds. Um, when you're talking about a fixed income investment, um, it's already going to be generally lower. But again, we're taking on less risk than we are with most stock, with most equity investments. But if you're really expect, if you really need to live off that income, you're really expecting a certain income to come in. Uh, don't forget about the top, the taxes, because if bonds are really only paying two, three percent right now, even though it's more steady than you could expect from some of the other investments we'll talk about today, um, those taxes can really eat into that two or three percent, uh, especially if you're paying 30, 40 percent taxes or, or whatever you're paying. Um, it, it, it could dramatically reduce that number if you don't plan for it. That's that keyword. If you don't budget for it, if you don't plan for it. So now we're talking about the more fun side of investing. You know, I've already said, OK, you want to buy some stocks, you want to buy some bonds. But there's all kinds of great things you can invest in there. And this is this is really where it comes. This is really where your personality, your choices, I think, are more important at this point. And different alternative investments out there, whether it's whether it's gold or other types of commodities or whether you're investing in some of the newer uh, assets like cryptocurrencies. Um, it may, maybe you're into fine art. I mean, hey, that's been a great investment. Uh, maybe you can. That's not really an investable piece of art. But you know, whatever your whatever your pleasure is, whether it's whether it's baseball cards. I saw a baseball card that sold for a million dollars the other day. Um, there are follow your passion. This is the kind of part where it's kind of your fun money. You can you can have a little fun with it. Um, you should also believe in what you're buying. Um, I don't find any type of investing personally is gambling. Uh, everything that I buy and I believe in for a reason. And if I don't believe in it, there's no real harm. There may be an opportunity cost to use a fancy economic term, but there's no real harm in me not buying something. Uh, there are certain things that are on this page right now that I might not believe in, so I just don't buy them. Buy in what you think you know, buy in what's fun. It's, it's in some way, I wanna say it's a hobby because this is an investment and we're trying to make money. But the reason why we're doing this is at the bottom of the slide. We're trying to, stocks and bonds are going to move, not necessarily together, but the stocks are going to move in one direction. Bonds we've seen through the correlation tend to move in the opposite direction. You start to build a portfolio, that's great. The fun thing about this is we're storing value in something that we like and we enjoy looking at. Uh, but it's also something that's probably not going to be correlated to either one of those more traditional uh, investments. So not only is it kind of fun, but uh, we also have the ability to kind of build in some natural diversification. Uh, that's why we look at something like this. Now, I think it's important when we talk about any sort of investing, um, when we talk about any type of assets, is something you've heard me say a couple times already today, but we just really can't stress this enough. Um, uh, educate yourself on what you're going to buy. Um, there, are a lot, there are a lot of structured investments out there, and structure doesn't mean they're bad, but sometimes what you think you're buying, if you don't read that prospectus, uh, isn't necessarily what you're actually getting at the end of the day. And there have been so many cases in recent history in the last 10 years or so, um, whether there are different levered funds out there, um, where, you, where people don't really read the fine print. And when something gets really stress tested, whether it's a volatility fund, there have been inverse commodity funds. Um, if you really need to go three times bullish or bearish on the price of natural gas, then there's, there's, more, there's easier ways to do it. I'll just say that. Uh, just know what you're buying. Again, investment is personal choice. Make your personal, uh, make your personal choices the way you want to make them. But most times people aren't going to read the one or 200 page prospectus for every investment they buy. If I sign up for something online, if I download something, an app to my phone or my some a program on my computer, I don't always read the terms and conditions. And you know what? Sometimes when I start up my computer, there's a little extra thing on the start menu. That's not a big deal. It's, that's not costing me money. But if you don't do your research and, and you're putting your money on the line, um, I, I think it's important to really understand what you're buying. And sometimes there are different products out there. I'm not going to single any out, but 
when you read, there are a lot of products out there that try to mimic the return of what you think you're buying. They're not actually buying what's underneath. So there's just a cautionary tale that sometimes those don't always work out the way you'd expect them to. So again, this why it's one of the reasons why I say that when feasible, consider buying that tangible asset, the underlying asset. Um, you know, commercial real estate. I'm sitting in a house right now that that we happen to, to own. Um, I don't need to buy a I don't need to buy a security a piece of this house. I'm fortunate enough to be able to own it. Uh, you talk about uh, if you're talking about gold or silver or something like that. In general, if you really want to own gold or silver, that's again that's up to you. But you're probably better off owning a coin or a bar or something you can hold on to than a piece of paper that's a fraction of a piece of paper that may or may not actually have a vault. Of the... Keep it simple when you're investing. And if you, the more structure you get into, just know what you're owning. That's all. There's nothing, nothing wrong with trading. There's nothing wrong with being a little bit more nimble. Um, but, but know what you're owning because I don't want – the worst thing that could happen is that people would get stuck because they could have done the research, but they didn't know they needed to or they felt like they didn't have the time. That's just kind of why we talk about this stuff. Um, and the same thing goes for REITs uh, and different real estate investments. If you can own the underlying asset, that's great. If you can't, at least know, at least have a pretty good idea of what they do. Um, and that, again, just gets to the idea. Just because it exists, um, there have been so many different funds, some of these structured funds over time, uh, that, have, that, that have been subject to fail. and. And it's just, it's one of those things that I think that's one of those risks that you're not getting compensated for. So you just won't need to be a little extra cautious on that. So now one of the assets that nobody likes to talk about is cash because cash is kind of boring, but I love being able to hold on to cash, whether I'm managing a stock portfolio, whether I'm managing just kind of my own personal portfolio, because that's because cash is flexibility and flexibility is freedom. The worst thing you could have to do as an investor is have to sell, whether it's a margin for selling or just because, hey, I really want to buy this stock, but I'm fully invested and I got to sell something else. If I always keep some cash on the sideline, and we'll mention maybe a sample number out there a little bit later, then I can buy what I want to when I want to. So always having that freedom and that flexibility, I think is something that's priceless. Uh, as you're looking to diversify your risk. And again, don't forget, when you're talking about correlation, it's 0% correlated to stocks, very close to zero when you're talking about uh, a lot of the other things we've talked about before. But also keep it simple. Again, you know, if cash isn't paying much right now, it's based on your account or at your local bank or wherever you have your cash stored, that's okay. Um, it, it generally, the more, the higher yield someone offers you, make sure you understand why you're getting that higher yield. We don't necessarily own cash to get rich. We have cash for the flexibility. We have it for the freedom. If I happen to make some money off of it, that's great. But, but if, if someone's offering you something that seems like a cash investment and the yield seems a lot higher than it's yeah, everywhere else, it may not be just cash as you and I know it. Um, but again, also remember why you're here. Uh, it, it's, it's to be patient. Um, look, I had a lot of discretionary investments going into this year. And for whatever reason, uh, back in February, I kind of had a feeling that, you know, I wanted to sell some of these discretionary investments. And so I raised cash across the portfolio, had 25% cash. And you know what? March came. And you would think, oh, that's great. You sold some stuff. But yeah, 25% cash is only so much of a buffer when everything in the world goes down 30%. It was better than having been fully invested. But it was nice to have that buffer. But all that time, if you're not using that cash again to, to buy when you have the opportunity, when things that you think are worth more are going down by globs and globs every day, that's why you have the cash. Be patient. Use the opportunities that are provided to you. And again, that's part of having a plan ahead of time rather than just blindly throwing money. I have money burning a hole in my pocket. I have to invest it in something. I'd, I'd much rather have that flexibility for when these opportunities present themselves, which they do for various reasons. I didn't, for, I didn't sell in February because I thought 
I was going to be working out of my dining room for the next four months. That's not why I sold. But because I did sell, I had a little bit extra flexibility and freedom um, to do this. So done enough talking. Let's show you some, some numbers. Let's show you some pictures about what I'm talking about. Now, this is a sample asset mix. This is something that generally resembles uh, kind of a, a baseline, something, a sample is something that I would look at, but this is by no means a recommendation, um, but it's a decent start uh, of, of maybe how you may want to start looking at your own investments. Um, now, again, there's a note at the bottom, this is separate of your primary, your primary home. If you're fortunate enough to own uh, your primary residence, whether it's a home or apartment, um, for a lot of people, that's their largest single asset. So I've excluded that from this. Um, so just talking about like stocks and bonds and stuff. So, you can put real estate in there. Say, hey, I don't need international stocks. If you want to invest 10% in extra real estate because you want to be a landlord, I am. It's not worth it sometimes. But if that's what you want to do, if that's what you know, then go for it. So generally, for most American investors, having about half of their money in stocks um, you know, is, is a good starting point. Now, generally, most people will tell you if you're a registered investment advisor, which I'm not, if you're a financial planner, which I'm not, they'll generally tell you if you're younger, you can take on more risk. But it's not about age. It's can you take on more risk? If you can take on more risk, generally, you can afford to own more stocks because you don't mind making more money and you're okay if you lose some now. Um, bonds are generally seen as a safer investment. And I think somewhere around the 20% range, that's a good start. If, if you want to own less, that's fine. You want to own more, that's fine. That's up to the individual. Now, that 5%, which just happens to be color-coded with gold, not a recommendation. Just putting, it was just the first word out there, and I found a color that was kind of goldish. Um, I, you know, the $5 for every dollar, or five uh, cents for every dollar you invest in to kind of throw in those alternative assets, uh, I think that's reasonable. Again. Do you want to put 10%? That's great. The, the big thing here with the sample asset mix is the more you put into some of these riskier things, I think you'll generally see the higher the investment number uh, are the things that are probably easier to understand. There's less variance and volatility in them. And the things that the lower number things, uh, the lower number investments in this, you'll probably find that there's more volatility and variance in the returns. So that's kind of that built-in diversification. Nothing wrong with, if, if you think gold or crypto or that fun money is swinging for the fences, that's great. But if you do that with 50% of your, your asset mix, now you're kind of moving into more gambling territory, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But we just need to, you just need to make sure we're aligned to our goals. Our goal is making money over the long term, whether it's retirement, whether it's saving for college, whether it's whatever we're doing, let's make sure that our assets are aligned to, to those goals. And again, I throw out 15% cash. I think that's a good baseline. Um, I wish I had had 100% cash <laughs> in March, but I'm not that good. No one's good enough to move money fast enough and be right every single time. That's why we diversify. Uh, we diversify to get rid of some of that risk and to make sure we're aligned to our goals every time. No investor is going to be right 95, 100% of the time. It's just not possible. And the, and the history books and Wall Street is littered with people that tried to write algorithms and develop things that were going to be right 100%. Don't be a statistic. We're, let's find our goal. Let's, let's understand what we invest in. And here's a sample idea of maybe how uh, we can build some natural diversification uh, into building things uh, while also making some money along the way. I mean, that's, that's why we do it. So I'm just taking a look at the clock. I think we got about five more minutes or so before we get to questions. Here's a quick reminder if you have some questions, um, however uh, you get them to, whether I believe there's a chat box or something, make sure you save up those questions. Um, we definitely have some time after I'm done speaking to address any of your individual questions. So now that we've built our portfolio, and again, whether it looks like mine, whether it's kind of like mine, or whether it's flipped upside down, 
how do you maintain it going forward? That's the key. Um, so you have to kind of build your own sample portfolio. Um, and, and from that, it's really kind of based on your individual risk profile. If, if you're just like, you know what, don't need to own individual stocks, I'd rather own, I'd rather own funds of stocks or I'd rather own ETFs of stocks, that's great. Understand the stocks that go in it. Now you, should, you probably shouldn't be buying the spiders, the S&P 500, 500 index, the Qs, the NASDAQ 100 index, and then be individually owning Apple or Microsoft, because that means you haven't done your research. That now means you own Apple and Microsoft three different times. Don't need to do that. That's not, that's not how diversification works. Uh, however that is, make sure you do your research. Now, we have to be nimble and flexible. Um, to, you have to be willing to change your mix up. Uh, that can be for different reasons. Maybe there's change in your life, uh, in your goals of change, or maybe just the environment change. Look, the stock market environment from, say, late, 2018 to uh, today has literally flip-flopped three different times based on where interest rates are going, based on what we expect, what's going on in the world, based on what's going on foreign relations, foreign trade, literally been flipped on its head several times. You don't have to change everything every day unless you want to, but you have to be willing to change with the times. Probably heard don't fight the Fed, and maybe it is different this time, but this falls in the category of not being allergic to make money. If you're bearish right now, it doesn't necessarily mean sell everything, short everything, bet against everything. There are ways to move your mixes into more defensive investments while not being allergic to making money if you're wrong. We're going to be wrong 40% of the time. Um, by, by keeping that diversification, by keeping that hedge, we'll make sure that we live to fight another day, even if we're not perfectly right uh, with predicting the future and how our investments are going to play. Um, and, that, and that's what gets into my final point I want to make before we open the floor up to questions. It really can't stress how important having a plan is. Your plan can be very basic at first. Just write down what I want to happen, what I don't want to happen. Um, from that, you can start to build that into actual individual investments. But by having that a plan, it, it doesn't matter if you've been doing this for 40 years, you've been doing this for four weeks. Emotion is a killer when you're talking about investments. If you're the kind of person that wakes up and you look over, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my TV right now. You know, if I just wakes up and you see, you know, everything's down stock wise, two and 3% and you're like, oh my Lord, get me out of here. Uh, it's going to be tough investing. So uh, having that plan ahead of time helps remove some of those emotions. You're going to have these days. I could talk about statistically the percentage of having these days. Just know they're going to happen. I don't know if it's going to be today or yesterday or tomorrow. But by diversifying, we have those natural hedges built in. We're owning assets across, uh, across various universes. Um, you'll be able to reach those goals, whatever those individual goals are. Um, so with that, that's about all I have for my prepared remarks. Uh, I want to thank everybody for the time. And if you have any questions, I'd love to open up the floor at this point. Oh, David, we have questions. That's for sure. Uh, they're, they're lining up here. So make sure if you have any more, put them in the chat box. We'll try to address them. We got about uh, seven minutes or so here that we can uh, answer some questions. So I'm going to start off with a short one, David. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about penny stocks? That comes from Kelsey. So penny stock. So again, like I said, um, I have uh, I have quite a bit of experience in low dollar stocks and small cap stocks. Um, penny stocks are by by definition one of the riskier stocks out there. Just know what you own. Look, if you're buying a penny stock uh, to to gamble, uh, I'm just going to say this nicely. <laughs> uh, the stock market there in penny stocks are generally people who have a better edge, and by edge I mean they know more than you do or I do. Uh, I would say that if you if if you see it as gambling, then I probably wouldn't. I'd probably stay away from it entirely. But there are plenty of really good companies that I can understand their business, and they're just a smaller version of a company that is more of a familiar of a household name. Those are the penny stocks that I would focus on. All right. Uh, next one we have here is from Linda. What are your thoughts on preferred REITs 
or hedging or balancing a portfolio full of stocks for hedging. I'm sorry, REITs for hedging or balancing. So, so when you talk about REITs specifically, um, this gets into more of where I personally believe investments are going right now. Um, my knowledge of the, the commercial market, and it's pretty much the consensus view, I'm not going out on a limb here right now. My knowledge of the, the, the commercial real estate market uh, is not that positive right now. And so what if I'm looking at a preferred stock, normally I'm owning a preferred stock for the dividend, but what's generating the dividend? It's the rents from those commercial assets. Uh, a lot of companies uh, are probably cutting back on the space they need, whether it's office, whether it's retail. Just look at, there's, there's REITs out there that invest only in dorms or hotels that are next to colleges. I know they exist. <laughs> Just be careful, know, which, know what the underlying assets are that's generating the cash flow to pay those dividends. Right now for, for commercial, I think that's a tough ask uh, in general. Um, and on the residential side, that's really just market by market. Uh, rates are low, which is good in general for most real estate investments. However, I'm not the, I don't have the most positive, broader economic outlook right now, which would not be positive for housing prices, which are generally at all time highs. All right, excellent, uh, David. This is oh, uh, this is from David. I would like to hear Dave's comments on precious metals, which have been in an uptrend for the past month or two. Nice question. Fantastic question. Great name, David. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, um, precious metals are something that I personally understand. They're something that that. I enjoy owning on a personal basis, but it doesn't matter why I do it or if I do it. The reason why they're going up right now is because they're seen as a general hedge against a weaker US dollar. And quite simply, you don't have to have a, a finance degree or an international finance degree to know that the more currency you print, which if you read the headlines in this country is happening a lot, it generally tends to devalue uh, the currency, in this case, the US dollar. Um, and it's been happening against most of the major currencies in the world. And I don't think we're done printing money. Uh, and by that, a lot of the stimulus plans that have been going on, it's literally creating new money. And what that does is generally more supply, brings down the price, um, and in, could ultimately lead to inflation now. There are cases in time when it's ultimately led to deflation. So we have to be careful. But that's one of the reasons. Now, if you're going to buy any precious metals, know this. Gold uh, and gold is pretty much the one that's seen as the best global inflation hedge. But just be careful because you'll see this if you look back at what happened in March and April. Silver, platinum are more industrial metals. So they actually went down quite a bit. Uh, and the futures market because they're seen as going into car batteries and stuff like that, that they don't necessarily all move together. So just keep that in mind. All right. So this one is from Connie. How do we identify companies that are about to be profitable? <laughs> That's a loaded question. No, fantastic. Look, uh, the, the biggest Wall Street firms in the world, uh, the brokerages houses out there, publish their estimates. There are simple screening tools. Um, you know, can't speak for every investment platform out there, but there are a lot of good free websites out there. And almost all of them, whether it's proprietary or a third party site, have a screening tool where you can screen for how much is this company going to earn next year? If you look for a company that's not earning any money now, that's supposed to earn some money next year. Uh, these estimates are more or less public knowledge. Um, you can look for companies that are kind of on that cusp. And historically speaking, that's been a great time to invest in a company. Because Wall Street's reaction, they're like, oh my God, this company's profitable all of a sudden. I have a stock that I sold this week. I bought it in April for 56%. Part of that's because the market was up a lot, but it outperformed the market, I believe. And I think it was a good investment then because they were on that cusp of profitability. That's why you saw that outsized gain. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, we got a a few more. Uh, we're getting to the end here, though, and there are many more questions. There's no way we're going to address them all. But uh, this one is from uh, Handle CD. 
how is owning a dividend stock different than selling part of a position since the dividend payout reduces the value of the underlying stock? How are they different and how are they similar, I guess? That's a technical question. That's a good one. So depending on how you buy a dividend stock, if it's something you're really buying for the long term, I would look into a dividend reinvestment plan. Again, it takes that dividend and kind of takes the guesswork out of it for you. Me personally, I've always been someone that, look, I think I can invest my money better than other people, but that's just me. I mean, that's my ego talking. So I'll take that cash and I'll put it where I want to. But if it's really a longer term thing, look into a dividend reinvestment plan. Like I said, the, the data doesn't lie. 43% of the money or 43 something percent of the gains over the last hundred years, longer than any of us have been doing this from the S and P 500 have been through dividends reinvested. All right. Well, I think that's going to be it. Uh, thank you so much, David, for uh, all your, all your remar remarks and thoughts on diversification all the way across the board. I guess you can't talk more about diversification than uh, all the asset classes that we touched today.